Good morning, everyone. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Our text for today is Exodus 21 through 21. Uh, and God spoke these words to the people and Moses who were gathered after the Exodus from Egypt. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving to you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance, while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Let me tell you about my and my wife Lynn's third date. I invited her over to my dorm room and served her vegetarian chili. Uh, she was a vegetarian in those days. She absolutely loved that I did that. Why did she love it so much? Because I had taken the trouble to find out something that was important to her and I had done it out of love. So I'm going to show my cards early in this sermon and tell you that I think that love has everything to do with the Ten Commandments and the Law of God. Let's look at the context. God's original, in God's original plan, all the law was to be given. And mostly this happens with Moses going up on the mountain while the people waited below. You heard a little of that at the end here. But the people grew impatient while waiting. They talked Moses' brother Aaron, the priest, into doing something very bad. Um, it was kind of a cow, but it didn't go moo. It was made up of gold. And they, they made and worshipped a golden calf. God was furious that the people had made a thing out of metal and given it credit for the acts of love and faithfulness that God had done by freeing the suffering Hebrew people from Egypt. In commandment number two, the one relevant to the situation, God even said, I am a jealous God. Well, my friends, that kind of jealous rage can only be born out of a deep, deep love. God loves the people and hopes that that love will be reciprocated. But rather than reciprocation, the people betray God's love and the Lord is, to put it plainly, furious. You can't feel that kind of intense sense of betrayal about someone you barely care about. Indifference, after all, just breeds more indifference, or at most contempt. But 
perhaps a clinical curiosity. But the God of the Bible does not act that way. God is passionate, engaged, and caring. God pursues a relationship with us. God rescues Israel from slavery with all the ferocity of a parent protecting a child. God woos Israel with all the ardor of a determined lover. In short, we are indeed in a relationship with God. Now, we know that relationships can be healthy or unhealthy. Have you ever been in or seen a relationship where one person won't let the other person be themselves? Sometimes a parent can be overbearing and trying to shape a child into what they want rather than who the child is. Similarly, let's suppose you are dating someone who won't let you be you. Maybe a girlfriend who wants you to quit all your hobbies so that you can spend all your time with her. Or a boyfriend who doesn't even want to want you to even talk with another male person ever wants to control everything that you do. I'm going to assume that most of us have either experienced a relationship like this one or seen one through it in our lives. So here's the big question. Is God an unreasonable, overbearing partner who attempts to prevent us from being us by issuing all these laws and decrees? I'm probably not going to get anyone in my congregation in Elmwood Park to take the bait and say yes. But here is how the Yes Caucus might say it. We hope to get to the point where we claim to know who we are and what is best for us. All these rules just get in the way of me, of us understanding our own individual identities. Plus, they give other people an excuse to judge us. In other words, our highest our knowledge of our highest and truest selves arise from within us, from looking inside. Here's the counterpoint we Presbyterian and Reformed people have been giving for centuries. If you want to know who you are, don't look at yourself, especially not inside yourself, look to God. Because our own sense of our own identity is at least shaded and probably tainted by distortion, by an outside fog that prevents us from seeing our real situation. We are imprisoned by sin. And the promise of the gospel is freedom, freedom from sin, freedom to truly be who we were meant to be. Now, wait a minute, say the skeptics. You're saying all these rules make us free? No, I respond. Not the rules themselves, but what they lead to. The rules, commandments, and laws are the entry point. They remind us that we do not make up our own identities from whole cloth. We are in relationship with the God who made us, the wonderful God who made the universe and gave us life. Let me come at this from another angle. Many years ago on a mission trip, one of our youth asked me a question. Why does God set commandments that are so hard to keep? Isn't that a great question? And I think I gave an okay answer at the time in between mouthfuls of fried chicken. But sometimes I ponder that question and ruminate on it. The first thing I want to do is to deconstruct it a little to ask what the subconscious assumptions are behind the question. It seems to me that the question assumes that God's law is a kind of test. If you keep the law well enough, you get a passing grade. If you don't, you fail and something bad happens to you. And if all I did were to read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges, I might have those assumptions too. But as I step back and examine the sweep of the whole Bible, I can no longer look at the law that way. Rather, I come to see the law as an articulation of values that are really important to the God we have a relationship with. And if we love God and want to have a relationship with God, We need to respect God's values just the way we would with someone else we love. After all, what would be the alternative? Should we ask God to change God's values to be in relationship with us? That would make us the unreasonable, overbearing partner. That would be pretty unfair and show our lack of respect. But I must point out that there are passages where Moses and Abraham and Jesus intercede with God to ask God to be merciful about human sin, and God does what they ask. Every week, 
our congregation offers prayers of intercession to ask God to do something about various situations in our world. This would be an utter waste if we didn't feel that God hears and sometimes answers those prayers. Now let me step back for a moment and assess. I've tried to make a case to you that the commandments are not just about God making us act in a certain way, but rather that they are an expression of God's love. But if my preaching professors were listening, they might be shaking their heads a little. The reason for that would be that I haven't offered any scripture passages to back up what I'm saying. So let me do that now. In the book of Romans, Paul is refuting arguments that the Gentiles must obey the letter of God's law. Chapter 2, 14 to 15 reads like this. When Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, even though they do not have the law, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. To me, this affirms that it is following God's values that pleases God, not that we are judged simply by how well we follow instructions. Now listen to Jesus' words as he said goodbye to his disciples in John 14 and 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in his name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. I don't know how it could be any clearer. God's law and commandments are born out of God's love for us, and we show our love by caring about what God cares about. The ancient Hebrews did not have the benefit of the New Testament. They were a people who had been beaten down by slavery and suffering and worry. When someone is traumatized, they often need clarity more than anything else. I remember visiting a halfway house for people being released from prison. The rules were very clear. Do this, don't do that. If you do that, here's what will happen to you. That was what was required in that particular situation. But even the Old Testament tells us that the summary of the law is to love God and to love our neighbor. When Jesus said that, he was not creating something new. He was simply restating just how important love is to God. But please don't hear my words and think that a feeling of love is all that is required. The law is like a covenant between two parties, like a marriage covenant. In a marriage, husband and wife voluntarily give up certain freedoms for the sake of their relationship. They agree that one of the meanings of their love is that they will act in certain ways and will not act in others. They give up something of themselves, and it is the same way with God. As we give up more and more of ourselves and turn them over to God, we can deepen our relationship and become more fulfilled. And we find that we can keep the law better and we don't find it odious. But that's not the point. The loving relationship is the point. So don't miss the point. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself, obey the law. They all go together in a beautiful way. And I pray that all of us will see that more and more as we continue our lives and our journeys with God. Amen, my friends. God bless.